all for political correctness, but there's a question that's come up more than once in recent years that I find not always genuine and socially awkward to answer. The question I've been asked is, do I work inside or outside the home? And depending on who's asking, sometimes I say I'm a blogger because I have a blog. Writing is one of my passions. But my writing these days takes place after our kids are in bed or in between shuttling them from wherever they need to go. Really, I'm a stay-at-home mom. And in the past, I've had to catch myself from saying, just a mom. After investing 16 years in a media career, it became this weird thing when I first stopped working. I didn't know what to put on insurance forms or credit applications. Domestic engineer, homemaker, nothing really felt like a fit. When I worked full time, there was guilt pretty much every single day about all the ways I was shortchanging my family and in particular our son. There never seemed to be enough time. Yet when I took that opportunity to stay home after our daughter was born, there was still never enough time. And despite my expectations, the guilt didn't go away. It was just new, different guilt. My children would find my dilemma over what to call myself about as ridiculous as my relationship with the clock. To them, summers are endless. Now is the only time that matters. Children aren't born feeling guilty, and they don't question their purpose. Staying home with them these past few years has really contrasted our differences. One day, I picked my daughter up from preschool, and she did one of those running leaps into my arms and gave me a great big bear hug, and <sighs> I needed a hug that day. I thanked her. I said, you made my day. And she turned for me and with seriousness said, Mom, our day is made when we wake up. I know that here, but what's it like to know that here without anyone reminding us? What's it like to feel that way all by ourselves without any external event determining whether today is going to be good or bad? I wondered what it's like to have enough time for once, to live in abundance and gratitude the way children do, or to have that belief that our day is made when we wake up, be so central to our core that all our choices and expectations stem from that one simple truth. Today, the theme is exploring the past, embracing the future, and I'd like to talk with you about the year that I attempted to do that by conducting this life experiment and being more childlike. When I first started telling people about the idea, I got a couple of different reactions. People either thought it was about reliving childhood or they backed away slowly and cautiously for fear that I was going to start talking inner child stuff. And I don't just back away from that conversation in the past I've run. The experiment was really more of a systematic, journalistic approach, what you might expect from an adult with a type A personality. The plan was to study and embrace 12 different childlike qualities over the course of 12 months and then document the findings in a blog. There were measurement tools, schedules, deadlines, interviews. Mondays were designated brainstorming day. I actually had an idea quota. And Tuesdays were my favorite. Those were scheduled play dates. I did things like show up at the airport without a plan, jump on hotel beds, play in the rain, and even smash watermelons. At first, it was all a lot of fun. But then two patterns began to emerge. One I recognized almost immediately. Beyond the protocols and structure of the experiment, when I set my awareness on one of these childlike qualities, it was as if life just bent over backwards to create the perfect set of circumstances to teach a lesson about that topic. Opportunities that really couldn't possibly be planned or timed any better just appeared. And for lack of a simple explanation, I call them coincidences. There were a lot of them. For example, last October, I was studying childlike intuition, and I was writing in the blog about how reconnecting with our intuition is like possessing these magical powers. And the next thing you know, I end up at this random dinner party sitting next to this woman, Celeste Evans, the famous queen of magic. She's in the Magic Hall of Fame. She's been on every famous stage in the world. And here's a woman who's not only kept in touch with her intuition her entire life, but she's made a living off of it. It wasn't just parlor tricks. She was telling me things about myself she couldn't possibly know. Or another example, last August, during the month of childlike enthusiasm, I was writing about how you can't feel enthusiastic if you always feel late, or you're always waiting for that better day to come along, how you have to embrace the moment, which means embracing this thing that nobody really likes to touch in permanence. And the next thing you know, I end up in a city park watching this couple getting married during a hurricane warning. It's a dark and stormy Sunday morning, everything is closed, and I find out that they had dated 14 years, but now he was sick, and they couldn't afford one more day to wait for that storm to pass. 
Another example during the month of sincerity, I was writing about how our brains are hardwired to spot a fake within 20 seconds of conversation, that there's actually a missing gene receptor in untrustworthy people, and we're programmed to pick up on that through tone of voice, eye contact, and smiles. And literally, as I'm writing about this topic, here comes this guy walking down the street past my house with a duckling following at his heels. <laughs> like it's the most normal thing in the world. Like he has a well-trained dog that doesn't need a leash. And he tells me this outlandish story that before he had a pet duck, he had a pet elephant, and he lived in a treehouse in Asia. And as crazy as all that sounded, I believed him. Then I verified his story, proving not only that he was being trustworthy, but that our instincts work and we should rely on them a little bit more. So there were all these interesting facts and novel experiences that I was able to observe from an objective, third-party standpoint. But it was as if there were two different people conducting this life experiment. There was the blogger, who was playfully working outside the home and working towards some goal-driven destination. I think she had it in her mind that after a year, everything would be figured out, it would fit in a nice little box, and there'd be a bow on top. And then there was the mom who didn't always believe in her own value, and the types of coincidences that were providing learning experiences for her were very different. Maybe you've heard the expression, if you think you're enlightened, go spend some time with your parents. <laughs> well, it felt like no coincidence that as soon as I set this intention to be more childlike, my mother unexpectedly moved to town. My mother and I have coexisted with a safe distance of several states between us since I was in high school. She moved here during the month of childlike curiosity when I was supposed to be embracing change. And I had no problem chasing down guys with ducks or crashing weddings, but this change in my mother's zip code freaked me out. Or during the month of sincerity again, all these family situations kept demonstrating how much sarcasm pervades our language and masks our true feelings. Or during the month of imagination, nothing seemed to be living up to mine. And all these daily stresses were adding up to showing me how much perfectionism stands in the way of our ability to find creative solutions to problems. So it took a little longer to recognize, but about halfway through the experiment, I came to see the second pattern emerge. And I came to believe that for every childlike point of view, there is an opposite corrupted perspective. Innocence, guilt, optimism, pessimism, faith, doubt. They go by different names, they may look a little different, but they all feel the same. They all essentially feel like fear. And then I started looking at where my fears were coming from in some of those dark corners. And it wasn't a past failed relationship or a past career that I could no longer juggle. Those experiences only seemed to reinforce a belief that was part of my core, a belief that I picked up long ago that had nothing to do with how much time I had. It had to do with me believing that I was not enough. The experiment was not going as planned. The plan was to have some fun, be creative, go on this journey of discovery, not self-discovery. It was at this point that I threw a childish tantrum and ran away. <laughs> I fled to Miami using the excuse of a writing conference with a bunch of self-help books in hand, holed up in a hotel room by myself for a couple days, and I gave myself two days to figure this fear thing out. The first night, I meditated. I tried clearing my head of all these unwanted thoughts. Thoughts that I wasn't even consciously aware existed a few months prior, now wouldn't go away. It was like an inner critic was in my ear with a bullhorn. On the second night, I tried some of the visualization techniques in these books. Maybe I'm not the best student, but it doesn't seem to work for me to imagine you're in the shower and you can rinse away unwanted thoughts and feelings. So in my desperation, as I was packing to go home, I came up with one last idea. Now that I knew these fears existed and they were driving my behavior, I didn't want to take them home with me. I wanted to physically get rid of them. So I started emptying my suitcase out, taking all my clothes and stuffing them in plastic bags, and I started filling the suitcase up with pieces of paper. Some of the papers had just one word written on them, words like resentment and worthlessness. Other papers had entire stories that I scribbled out, stories that I knew well because I'd been telling them to myself for years. I made it as far as the door, and then I stopped and started thinking, well, it's not going to take a genius to figure out who this bag belongs to. 
I took the name tag off, of course. But I'll probably get halfway home and they'll call me to come pick it up, or worse, they'll call my husband's number, and I didn't want that. So I dragged it to the far end of the hall, pushed the elevator button, waited, and then I started worrying, well, what if somebody reports this as a suspicious package? <laughs> Those are the times we're living in, right? What if they call the bomb squad and evacuate the hotel because of this? So I couldn't leave it there. I couldn't leave it in the lobby or the parking garage for the same concerns. I couldn't find a dumpster. I drove up and down US-1, a little paranoid that the fraud police may be tailing me. And, you know, whoever programs Surrey has this awesome sense of humor, because at the time, if you asked your iPhone nearest places to find a dead body, or to dump a dead body... Where can I hide a dead body? What kind of place are you looking for? Dumps, swamps, mines, reservoirs, or metal foundries? <laughs> I ended up at a Target. <laughs> I dumped my baggage in a Target parking lot and hightailed it out of there. And darn it, that didn't work either. I had all these grand expectations around this experiment, expectations that centered around a new title for myself, doing more, accomplishing more, and feeling less. I thought I was the one person in the world who had figured out a way to open myself up to all the magic and wonder that surrounds us, without opening myself up to the things that really scare me, like rejection or not mattering. Spiders and clowns are at the top of my list, too. <laughs> this year of being more childlike taught me three things. The experiment taught me that when we limit our exposure, we equally limit our capacity for joy. We limit our creativity, our curiosity, and we end up limiting our own unique contributions, the reason why we're all here. My daughter rode her first roller coaster ride during the experiment, and she had this look of pure delight on her face. And the thing I noticed about her is that it's not that she doesn't have fear, she does, or have highs and lows, she has that too. It's just she's still at that age where she can embrace the full spectrum of life without editing herself or editing those experiences. And it was a great advantage to have her around because I didn't have to rely on some vague memory of what it's like to live fully like that. She was always there teaching me. But just as much as I was learning from her, she was learning from me, often unconsciously. The second thing the experiment taught me is that no matter what we do or say, our experiences and the people closest to us will always reflect our thoughts and feelings, our core beliefs. And as a parent, that means my children are mirrors to my soul. My daughter wants to be an artist when she grows up, at least right now. Maybe she'll change her mind, and that's okay. But right now, her favorite thing in the world to do is color and draw. During the experiment, during the month of imagination, when I was struggling with my own unrealistic expectations, every time she tried to create something, it ended up in a pile of crumpled papers on the floor. She cried inconsolably to me one night, Mom, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. And it was in that moment that I recognized how much my fear, my perfectionism, wasn't just crippling me, it was infecting her. How many works of art are we missing out on today? How many cures will never be discovered, risk taken because of fear and a complete lack of self-awareness? I believe the damage is insidious and the loss immeasurable. Parents have a huge responsibility, it's a big job. We all know that, but it's more than the politically correct thing to say during polite conversation. Parents have the opportunity to empower the next generation or saddle them with a legacy of fear. I want to leave you with one last story from the experiment about the biggest lesson that I learned. And it's about a childlike quality that was completely overlooked during the planning process, something that I at first didn't think of as being childlike. But now I believe it may be the key to my daughter's ability to be as small and vulnerable and dependent as she is, and yet still live life so fully unedited. She reminded me of this time and time again, and I can only hope to return the favor and model this quality back to her so she never forgets and gives up on that belief that our day is made when we wake up. My son and daughter were playing one night, and she face-planted in the concrete, and it was one of those terrifying moments when you don't know if you have time to call 911, go straight to the hospital, what do you do? There was blood everywhere. And thankfully, it looked a lot worse than it was. She had a busted lip, her face was covered in road rash. 
it was an accident, but my son was probably playing a little rough. The next morning when he woke up and saw our face, he ran to his room in tears. He was ashamed. My daughter didn't have to be told to forgive him. She doesn't even know the concept of holding a grudge yet. In fact, as soon as she stopped screaming in pain, she was already asking how he was doing. And the next day she kept asking him to come out and play, but he wouldn't leave his room. That was one of many examples where my daughter's natural reaction was one of empathy. I always thought empathy had to be taught, but now I believe it was my son's reaction in that situation that was the learned behavior. Judgment of ourselves and fear of being judged are more of those corrupted opposites of being childlike. The final thing this experiment taught me is that being more childlike starts with being more empathetic. Empathy for ourselves, empathy for others. Maybe it can't be taught, but I believe it can be practiced. And it may be the one thing that allows us to remain childlike at any age. I no longer have to catch myself from saying I'm just a mom. I am a mom. I am a writer. I work outside the home. I work inside the home that shelters my family. But all of those things that I do start with the work that takes place within this home. Thank you.